Hi everyone, um, so I'm Director of People and Culture at FutureLearn, um, and, uh, which is an online learning platform. For those of you that don't know, um, we have nearly 8 million learners um, on our site. We've been going for about five years now. Um, uh, I've been there for uh, four years on and off. I had a brief period where I went and worked for Comic Relief. Um, you may see a pattern in some of the places that I've worked, so I'm very passionate about uh, trying to change things in the world. Um, uh, and previously I worked at The Guardian and my background is actually in product management um, and I got very into understanding how teams work effectively together and uh, earlier this year was promoted to my current role now. Um, so in terms of um, what organisations value whilst I've been sort of like in teams very focused on um, how we all operate together like thinking more broadly is quite a new thing for me and I'm learning all the time about uh, what type of organisation we're trying to build at FutureLearn. Um, and so I guess that's why I really wanted to make sure that we had a bit of workshop in this because I'm sure that there'll be many people in this room who uh, have been through um, uh, changes at organisations that can share their ideas and share how they think that's improved society for the better. Um, and so I really want to hear from some of your perspectives and some of your experiences as well. Um, uh, so before I uh, get to the crux of the topic, just some caveats that um, when I refer to society, I'm generally referring to Western society that I have experienced and that um, I have read about as well. Um, you know, all societies are different, all cultures are different, not all of this is going to be relevant to uh, uh, certain societies. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, I am only human. Um, so uh, I'm only reflecting what I understand of the world and what I understand of um, organisations. Uh, so um, if you disagree with anything that I say, then please let me know at the end. Like I, again, will welcome any perspectives on what I've said. Um, so uh, the structure will be that I'll talk for roughly 10 minutes on um, uh, how examples of how I think organisations reflect our society. And then I'll talk in about two areas in which I think we can change society through our organisations. And one will be around the measure of success and the other one will be around valuing difference. Um, and then we'll spend some time uh, doing a short workshop at the end. Uh, so, how organisations reflect society, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, uh, I was originally just going to do the bad and the ugly and I did this talk to someone at work the other day and they were like, surely there must be some good things about organisations, Tessa. I know that you're secretly a communist at heart. but uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so I did do some digging around for some good examples um, of where organisations reflect good parts of our society. So I'll start there. Um, so the first thing that came to my mind, because I like love working in teams and I love exploring the way that teams um, gel together, was not necessarily Spotify, but the amount of companies, and I'm sure many of you here work in those companies, that invest time in uh, thinking about how they give teams more autonomy, um, how they create tight-knit groups um, that are able to collaborate effectively together. And for me, like what that reflects, the good part of our society that reflects, is how we build communities and uh, things like our uh, family units. And that doesn't have to be very stereotypical family units, but the way in which we build relationships um, and find like support networks and things in order to do things. So that was one example. Um, the other example uh, that I could think of was um, flexibility. Um, and I think through the technological revolution, um, uh, our society has fr transformed into a much more flexible society and we are able to access lots of different things, lots of information, um, anywhere, anytime. Um, and many of the more forward-thinking organisations have adopted this in the way that they em employ people, um, the way that they allow people to uh, fit their work around their personal lives um, and allow them to work from anywhere. Um, and then the last example 
So when I was researching this talk, I got very excited about Bosch, weirdly. Um, <laughs> so this is Robert Bosch, who started Bosch, the um, massive uh, organization. I think they're like 10th on the FTSE 500 or whatever. And um, they're based in Germany. They supply all sorts of parts to different companies. Um, uh, and he basically said that he's always acted according to the principle that it's better to lose money than lose trust. And I was like, wow, this is like the foundation of this multi-million um, uh, pound business. Um, and they also, in his will, he said that he wanted the profits from Bosch to go to charitable um, efforts. So they set up a foundation and 92% of Bosch's profits go um, through that uh, foundation uh, to charitable causes. Um, they also invest 50% of their R&D budget into um, uh, conservation and environmental protection technology. Um, so I was really excited about this. Uh, and then I discovered the bad. Uh, <laughs> um, I didn't realize that they were involved in uh, the VW emission scandal. Um, so they were actually the organization that provided the um, defeat devices that were designed to enable VW to basically circumvent emissions tests. Um, so that got me thinking, you know, <laughs> As much as, these, like, as much as our organisations and these organisations strive to be better and strive to make a positive impact on the world, there is always, inevitably, some bad. Um, and so uh, I pulled up these two examples in terms of how uh, these organisations reflect our society. So um, VW, uh, for me, reflects, um, I guess, a... Uh, lack of sort of responsibility to the, to, to the world and um, to the consumers that you're serving, um, a sort of drive for growth and um, continuous production and continuous um, sales and things. Um, I also pull up Carillion here, which um, some of you will be familiar with um, in news earlier this year that um, you know, they've gone under, but uh, the, one of the main things about the whole scenario was that directors were continuing to pay themselves massive bonuses um, uh, at the detriment to uh, the company and at the detriment to their employees. Um, but these are not sort of unique examples. You hear about these types of things all the time that organisations do. Um, uh, now, the outright ugly. <laughs> um, these are just some of the things that uh, have... Uh, been uh, talked about a lot this year. So um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it at the back. Uh, we had the Me Too campaign um, earlier this year where a lot of um, women in particular talked about um, sexual harassment that they'd experienced at work. Um, and uh, uh, loads of companies pulled up on the fact that they had hundreds of harassment complaints that went uninvestigated. Um, our lack of diversity, our lack of representation of um, the people that exist in the UK, for instance, um, in some of our um, uh, uh, top companies that sort of control most of the economy. Um, apparently, it's at 2%. 2% of our um, uh, top 100 companies have directors that are from minority ethnic backgrounds, but uh, there are 14% of our population, our UK population, are from minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, and then... Um, uh, the pay gap, uh, which currently stands at 18.4%. Um, this is something that is affecting most organisations and something that uh, um, is stuff that is within these organisations' control to change in many ways, but they are ultimately all of these organisations are products of our society and they are... Um, uh, this is happening because there are systematic issues um, within our society. Um, and so what type of society is that that these organisations are reflecting? Um, so ultimately we operate in a capitalist society um, where uh, we're always after growth, we're always after uh, profit and revenue um, and where there continues to be a rise in individualism. And by individualism I mean um, the focus on the individual um, to go for the things that are um, that they need or that they think they need um, uh, without any 
or limited regard for the impact that that has on others. Um, uh, and that's what lots of these organisations are reflecting, right? That's what um, uh, the VW emission scandal reflects. Um, a society where that quite explicitly values certain people a lot more than others. You know, we've actually got a number on how much more uh, men are valued in this society than women. 18.4% um, financially, technically. Um, uh, and there's a whole a uh, lot more to that as well that we have not yet explored as organisations properly. So we have not yet started talking about the disparity between uh, white men and black women, for instance, enough um, in, uh, in this society. Um, and also a society where we're all willing to turn a blind eye for an easy life. Um, there was lots of employees admittedly, that spoke up around uh, the behaviours of VW and the behaviours of Carillion and they, and they speak up continuously about um, discrimination and inequalities within organisations. But ultimately, we all just want to get by. Um, we all just want to do our jobs, go home um, and enjoy our lives. Um, and so lots of... It's, it's often easier for us to not talk about these things in our society because that's what we're sort of encouraged to do. Um, uh, and then, uh, just to sum up what I'm trying, the picture that I'm trying to paint, uh, I was um, uh, chatting to someone at work the other day about a uh, This American Life podcast, which um, covered a um, airline uh, in America um, that really treated their employees really badly. Um, and he just responded to me and said, sadly, a lack of humanity appears to be official American po policy in every aspect of life. So no wonder it infects the workplace. Um, you can, like I said, you can disagree with me on any of these things. Um, but uh, so my question really to all of you and as part of this talk, uh, and infect is probably the wrong word to be using here, um, like, how can we, as workplaces and as organisations, do the reverse and infect society for the better? Um, uh, so which brings me on to uh, one area, which is the measure of success. Um, so uh, the way in which we sort of generally measure success in um, society and in our country um, and lots of other countries is through the measure of GDP. Um, which is gross domestic product. Um, there's been lots of coverage about how this isn't an effective way of measuring prosperity. Um, but what it basically measures is the, um, the total value of final goods and services that any country produces. Um, and the way in which it m is measured means that if you sit in your car for five hours in traffic, you positively contribute to this growth in GDP. Um, but if you are at home raising your child, cooking dinner, changing nappies, making sure that your child is safe and secure, you generally uh, don't pos uh, contribute positively to GDP. Um, so there is no wonder that, for instance, organisations haven't yet equalised parental leave, for instance, and given people equal parental leave, because we're told by society that that's not of value to our prosperity um, as a country. So uh, what can we do to change the measure of success within society? And I'm going to talk about organisational level, um, team level and individual level. And they're just going to be very specific examples of what we could do. And then we'll open up for like other ways of changing things um, at the end. Um, so organisational level, this is a bit... Old, uh, but build a new economy. Um, so uh, we need to create organisations that think beyond just their service and just their profit and their costs, their direct costs. Um, and I went to Meaning Conference last year and saw Kate Rayworth talk. I don't know if anyone in this room would be familiar with her. She's an economist um, and she's developed what is called Donut Economics. Um, and she believes that all organisations in the 21st century should be talking about their impact on the world in relation to this donut. Um, and what it's made up of is an ecological ceiling, which are like things that we should not be overshooting because if we do, um, we will destroy the world in which we live. And the red shows you where we are already overshooting as um, a society. Um, and then uh, the centre is the social foundation 
that um, she says um, uh, we need to meet for everyone across the world um, in order to create a socially just space in which humanity can thrive. Um, and so uh, she believes that um, organisations actually taking this and using this and talking about this instead of uh, what I would say is simple profit and loss. Um, my CFO will hate me for saying that. Um, uh, will en enable us to change some of the uh, some of society's biggest problems. Um, uh, and I've got printouts of this that I'll share around because it's quite a lot to take in on there. Um, but the problem with getting organisations to adopt this is that it's quite complicated. Right, and it, and it requires a lot of more complex decision making within organisations. So a lot of uh, CEOs will probably turn around and say, what's in it for us? This is what my CEO is saying to me at the moment. Um, and uh, firstly, more motivated and loyal staff. There are so many studies um, that show that intrinsic motivation um, and whether uh, people feel able to make a difference in the world and have an impact will make them more productive um, and make them more loyal to your organisation. Um, a larger audience. Um, so uh, what I mean by this is, for instance, FutureLearn uh, currently, our purpose is to transform access to education, right? So our service is like helping in this area. But what if we thought about what our impact could be as a company in relation to uh, people's access to networks or access to energy. If we um, improve that for society, then that broadens the number of con con potential consumers that we have, right? If we uh, enable people to have access to energy and access to networks, then they can access our platform. Um, uh, and finally, a more sustainable business. Um, so the failure rate for startups is around 90%. Um, and apparently, uh, of the Fortune 500 companies that were listed in 1955, more than 88% of them are gone or have been merged into another um, company. And I don't personally want to live in a society where companies are spun up, grown and sold for a massive profit or, um, uh, you know, people... Uh, just take what they need personally um, and move on. Um, so what can we do at a team level? Because um, that's quite a big challenge, uh, building a new economy. So a very simple thing that um, I think you can do at a team level in order to, to change how you think about success is building team principles. Um, so at FutureLearn, we have um, a whole range of different types of team principles. So we have our company-wide um, values. We have five values. One of them is empower others. And what this um, encourages our people and our partners to do is when they're making decisions about things to not be thinking about what am I going to get out of this or what, am, what is the company going to get out of this, but be thinking about how can I support other people? How can I give as many benefits as possible to our users in um, producing uh, this thing? Um, what can I do to better enable them? Um, uh, another example is we have design principles that our design team follow. One of them is think universally. And again, when they're creating something, having this at the forefront of their mind reminds them that there are all sorts of different types of learners accessing our site and they need to be thinking about how, um, whether that platform can be understood um, uh, in different cultures, in different languages, um, uh, and uh, with people with different needs. Um, but we ultimately do still live in a capitalist society and I'm not going to change that as much as I would love to. <laughs> um, so in terms of like uh, the people who want to have this sort of impact, uh, we do need to be able to show those uh, who are more commercially minded, let's say, um, that these have benefits and like what can we actually measure um, and so for example in relation to um, sorry um, in relation to empowering others we should be measuring things around like the number of people who report or provide evidence of the positive impact um, from your support or service so we do this now in terms of how we collect our learner stories and speak to employers and speak to um, people across the world about the impact of taking our courses and that 
ultimately translates into money for anyone that wants to look at it that way. Um, because if you're satisfied with the service, if you get a lot out of the service, then you're more likely um, to uh, want to buy it again. Um, so and on, on, the, on an individual level, um, building self-awareness, building awareness of um, what you think uh, is success for you. Um, so these are a whole different load of ways that uh, you can build that self-awareness, like coaching and being coached, um, uh, learning about ourselves through conversation, um, about why we operate in a certain way and why we strive for certain things. Um, uh, thinking about things like what you need from your work besides pay. Um, that's what we're all sort of taught to go after in many ways. Um, but more and more employers are being expected to give their people different um, uh, rewards and different ways um, of uh, uh, making their lives a success. So thinking about that flexibility that uh, uh, employer might be able to offer, thinking about different types of uh, leave you could have, um, for instance, um, not just asking for more pay. Um, and then my final point, uh, sorry, I'm a bit over time, uh, valuing difference. Um, so the reason why I'm talking about this in relation to measuring success as well is because I think the two are very, very linked. Um, and the reason why I think they're linked, multiple reasons, but uh, the main reason in relation to this talk is I, start, I started by talking about how we needed to change our economy and how organizations can help us to do that. Um, and so difference, different perspectives, different backgrounds, different experience is the only way in which we're going to be able to tackle some of the biggest problems in the world. Um, we will not solve these problems if we solely, um, uh, if we solely keep sort of uniformity in the types of people who are making decisions. Um, and uh, with regards to my earlier examples of organisations, like I said, they are not unique. Um, you know, the gender pay gap is not unique to um, particular um, organisations. And the reason why we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over is because we have not valued difference enough and we have the same types of people with the same types of mindset um, running these organisations, basically. Um, and then finally, I joined individual and team together, together because uh, uh, I do not have enough time. Uh, so uh, the most important, like the most powerful thing that I think we have as humans and that I think we have within teams is the ability to build empathy um, and champion difference. Um, so I uh, read a book recently around about autism um, and there's a quote from Hans Asperger uh, back in 1938 and he was um, studying Asperger syndrome uh, in um, Nazi Germany um, and he stood up at a conference and said not everything that steps out of line and is thus abnormal must necessarily be inferior um, and like I was slightly heartwarmed reading this in some ways, but then slightly also terrified that since 1938, we still haven't really got this into our heads as a society. We still sort of react to difference um, in many situations in a negative way. Um, and I believe that a good team really champions and embraces um, that difference, like knowing how to play that as a strength and not a weakness. Um, you know, we talk a lot as a society about cohesiveness and you know bringing people together but actually um, uh, knowing that when we have differing opinions and when we have different experiences that is actually um, uh, much more stronger I see it as like building an ecosystem of people rather than a single species species of conformity um, and some really simple ways uh, that we've built empathy uh, at future learning in our teams uh, we do a lot of drawing of our experiences um, and the great thing about this is that when you don't have the language to describe how you're feeling or um, what's influencing um, why you think we should do something in a certain way, drawing helps to draw that out um, and uh, it also enables you to talk about things that you wouldn't otherwise talk about if you had to put it into words. Um, and when we did this exercise when I started a new team and it was about their uh, perspective of what they thought 
future learn would be like and then what it was actually like um, we got lots of people talking about their mental health um, we got people talking about their religion and how that impacts um, how they view things we got people talking about um, uh, their sort of biases towards what they thought the company would be like and what it was actually like um, and what they thought their teammates would be like um, there's a whole load of different things that I won't go into uh, but there's also uh, the last thing I was going to say on this in terms of building empathy is that it's the really small things like repeated small things that build up trust between people that are different. Um, so uh, on one team we had um, someone uh, who was Muslim, they were the only person that was Muslim on that team um, and it was Ramadan and they were really struggling with um, uh, coming to stand up. It was, very, it was an early stand up and because of fasting and things um, they weren't able to um, uh, attend at that time and so we just shifted the time. No one complained. It, like. It didn't matter to anyone else, but that small action built a huge amount of trust between that person because they knew that they were respected um, for, um, for their religion and they were valued um, for their difference. Um, uh, and when I returned to work as a breastfeeding mother, um, uh, my team were amazing at sort of, again, making accommodations for me, moving stuff around so that I could do what I needed to do and also being curious and like asking me what... Um, it was like and what, what I was struggling with. Um, and then finally, at an organisational level, um, how can we value difference more? So I think our first step is to build up diversity and inclusion goals, and this is a massive thing that lots of organisations are talking about at the moment. Um, and it's going to be really hard because, like, as organisations and as individuals, we're correcting for generations of discrimination and inequality from within our society. And that is complicated. Um, so we need goals to make sure that we're making progress. Um, and I don't know whether uh, any of you saw the um, uh, thing that uh, Lionel Shriver said about Penguin's um, diversity targets. They're aiming to have all new re writers representative of our UK population uh, by 2025. Um, and there are lots of people slagging it off in, in terms of saying it's, a diverse, it's just about ticking our diversity box. But I think more companies need to be setting out what they are aiming for and be ready um, to face any challenges from people. Because that's how we all change society. People setting out what type of vision, what type of organisation they want to be trying to build and educating themselves and educating others along the way. Um, uh, and if anyone's interested in talking in more detail about what FutureLearn is doing about this, um, uh, I could chat loads about uh, different things that we're doing in terms of recruitment practices um, and how we support different people to progress. Um, I'm going to skip over what you could measure. Basically, everything, you can bring it back to money somehow if you really want to. Um, <laughs> uh, having uh, now ex had more exposure to how we talk about money and things in organisations, like, yeah, you can, you can definitely make it up if you need to. Um, <laughs> uh, and finally, so the reason why uh, I wanted to share all of these things around uh, uh, how things that you could change in organisations and why I think they can change society, society is because we, at the moment in the UK we have 32 million people who are in work, right? And so even if just a fraction of those workforces change the way they operate, then you've got a massive movement in society um, and you've got all of their friends and family and if you if your organization makes an impact on the way that they think about things then that will make an impact on everyone else that they interact with um, so they have huge power to change society and I, we have the ability to grasp hold of that thank you right. uh -huh. sorry i went a bit over um, so uh, I know that there may be some questions, um, so I will come around different tables and stuff. But what I wanted to invite people to do is um, to pick something that you would like to change about society as a group. Um, and I will share around the donut thing that I shared, because that might spark some ideas. Um, 
decide on actions that you think could be taken um, and think about like individual things that people can do, what teams can do, what organizations can do. Um, and the reason why I break it down like this is because uh, lots of people feel like, oh, if I, you know, when you talk about recycling, people are like, oh, I can't bother to recycle because what, is, what difference am I going to make? Um, but when you think about how all of these things have knock-on effects, um, uh, I really do believe that individual actions can be just as powerful as organisational actions. Um, and then have a discussion about whether there's any way in which you could measure the success of that action. Um, and uh, what I will then invite you to do after that is, I haven't got stickers, so we'll use black um, Sharpies, um, is to um, come and like for every idea that your group has had, just make a mark on the uh, donut that I'm going to put up and it will just be um, a representation of how uh, if you have lots of different people coming at different ideas from different perspectives, you can uh, fill in a lot of those sort of gaps in society, if that makes sense. Um, so that's what I would like you to do. Last thing that I'm going to ask you all to do, and this is going to be very awkward for lots of you, sorry, um, is a, a lot of my talk was really like about being more mindful. Um, uh, I am a bit of a hippie. I am wearing a dog dress, like, so apologies. Um, <laughs> uh, so what I want to invite you to do is just spend two minutes sitting in complete silence. I don't want you to introduce yourself to anyone. Um, uh, and I just want you to like think, you don't have to think about what, what was in the talk if you don't want to. You can just think about like how you're feeling. You can get some of the crap that's on your mind from work today off of your mind. Um, and then I'll tell you when that time is up. I might be nice and shorten it if it gets really uncomfortable. And then, uh, and then we can get cracking. Okay, cool. The time starts now. <laughs> Right, two minutes is a long time. I'm going to save you all. We did a minute and a half, nearly. So, <laughs> um, thank you. I'm very impressed. That, that I, that's partly why I do these talks, so that you have power over a room as well. <laughs> um, I will, I think people are generally in groups. You might want to get together these two threes here if you've got, um, if you want to, but you can stay in these groups. Um, uh, I will hand these out in case you want to look at them for inspiration um, uh, and then uh, after like I guess 15 minutes 20 minutes or so um, we will get back together and see how many of the world's problems we can solve uh, through our organizations <laughs> So I realised I uh, kept looking at you and I think I also was looking at that man there. You know when you like lock on to... Uh, what actions could be taken by is your own judgment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's so simple. And, you know. <laughs> what I would like to do is um, get teams just give us a sense of what you talked about um, uh, and if there's any like particular ideas that you want to highlight in 
you don't have to talk about all of them, you don't have to talk about what you talked about in relation to individuals, teams and organisations, just something in particular that you um, really like the idea of, um, and whether you discussed uh, how you would measure the success of that. Um, but I would also like you to do is, um, if one of you could like have a little count of how many different ideas you came up with as a group, and um, uh, when we get to you, if you could shout out which area they relate to as well. I will put a mark on here. Um, so I'm going to start with this table. Uh, would anyone like to speak? <laughs> cool, so this team's going to uh, share just quickly what they chatted about. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Everybody. Hi. So we um, decided to look at waste in general. Um, this was Ava's idea, and we zeroed in on uh, food waste in particular. So um, we looked. It's kind of a scattering of things, and we'll explain them as we go through. So. Um, we talked about the idea that, for example, that the organisations could work to better redistribute food um, <coughs> they're not using. Um, so, for example, instead of putting it in landfill, because a lot of it actually does go to landfill rather than being um, reprocessed, um, then uh, instead give it to people who need it instead of throwing it away. Just do you want to? Oh, okay. So, um, I think the other one is. Um, for example, one kilo of carrot. So, uh, <laughs> most of the time, the farmers they have to throw it away um, because um, the supermarket or us as individuals we just don't see that as healing. So, um, we should all support um, those people with cheap vegetables, fruits, so that um, the supermarket can start selling it and we, we should start supporting it so that, that we also <laughs> have to um, reduce the waste. Cool. So another team one, so another individual one rather, is uh, the idea of buying more than we need. So there's this idea that people buy uh, enough to fill the space in their fridge, because people don't like to see space in their fridge, so we'd rather than buying what we need for meals, we just buy to fill space. So um, it's kind of a, a mindset shift, and actually people who have smaller fridges um, waste less food. Um, so yes, individuals can buy just what they need rather than Right, so um, I think as a team, maybe the last one. Yeah, so like um, yeah. the other one is really as a team, like um, there is an idea where um, I think um, she, she mentioned that um, is to have kind of like, say for example at a workplace, you actually cook a lunch and then just share together. One, two person just cook, you know, for your colleague cook for your colleagues and then we all share the food together that, that we want to reduce the waste as well as a team. Um, I'm going to, I know you've got loads more ideas, um, I'm going to move you on and if people could um, give a round of applause. Um, and then if someone could just share like one or two ideas from their group, but also give me, if you've got numbers on how many ideas you've got and what they relate to, shout that out at the end as well. Uh, this group, yeah, go on. So we did get around to actually writing anything down on a bit of paper, but I could try and like blag the way that symbolises the way we're thinking, but I'm not going to do that. You're, you're all more intelligent than that, I'm not going to do that. So but what we spoke quite a lot about was the level of control in society and whether we need it a lot. So we kind of started speaking a little bit about systems thinking and Edward and uh, Edward Denning and Russell Ackoff and about whether we need the level of control in society that we do and what would happen if we started to remove parts of it. We didn't really get down to how that is relevant in the individuals and teams and organisations. We've come up with lots of different ideas and a really hearty discussion about the world, which was quite nice for really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've uh, at least answered my other question that I was going to ask of people, which is how they found the discussion. Yeah. Um, and I guess you all gave yourself your own political voices. Largely, <laughs> <laughs> we kind of agree. No rules. <laughs> yeah, level, levels of control, whether they're... I'm, I'm, whether they're I'm, I'm an outlier to the team over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in a normal position. <laughs> uh, 
Um, anyone else want to share any ideas? So we were talking a lot about recycling as well. We also t- I ended up talking about waste, uh, but we were talking initially about how, uh, those disposable cups um, uh, and what we've done, sort of like you know individual responsibility as well as teams and organisations. Um, and we were talking about how sort of you know not only sort of like the, the carrot but the stick as well. So well, which should we? As organisations, we could give those things away quite often. And sort of, you know, it's a barrier to entry of actually the cost of them. And um, you know, like your two pound cup of coffee, twelve pounds. Um, uh, and so we could do that, um, as well as rewarding people slightly by by having it less. Also, as well within actually our teams in in companies, we were saying that we could um, uh, actually. Get, use those and maybe have a, a ladder of success so how many times you've actually used it um, rather than sort of like you know, give them away and they sit on a dusty shelf somewhere uh, positively using it uh, then we got onto a sidetrack about uh, um, uh, using paper and too many paper towels in the, the bathroom uh, to put the bathroom in the middle. Um, I would thoroughly recommend watching the TED talk about pre shaped in hand, using less paper towels, it's very interesting. Uh, but it's all about uh, re- re- less waste, less landfill. Cool. Um, this group. Like. Oh, us. Um, we don't have anything that kind of light. We went for a heavy stuff. Oh. Like, you know, hiring psychopaths and these leaders and trying to get rid of and control that. So, <laughs> somebody help me, come on. <laughs> so the areas that we figured it would impact is health, mm-hmm. education, um, yeah. maybe a bit of work. Yep. And um, the answer to the three questions on the board, mm-hmm. the individual actions we decided was um, Providing instant feedback, interacting, bringing things out in the open. Mm-hmm. Exactly. She's a sociopath, whatever. <laughs> so it's basically, instead of acknowledging the fact, but giving no feedback and they happily go on their wake of disaster, um, talk, communicate, whatever, and either help the people along in the right direction or mm-hmm. get them out of the organisation. Mm-hmm. That can only happen by flagging things. Mm-hmm. And then on the team action level, Encourage everybody to be a leader. It was talked mm-hmm. about management tends to be a big structure. The game is get to the top and everybody tries to short circuit that. So change the rules. So instead of you being managed, you're led. And mm-hmm. then you have to lead other people, not manage other people. Mm-hmm. So it's making everybody comfortable with the concept of leadership. So mm-hmm. it's leaders leading leaders leading leaders so everybody can lead. Um, and then at the organizational level, um, it's acknowledging the fact that within today's corporate structures, there's too much power in the CEO's office. Mm. So everybody plays the games to try and get there, mm-hmm. and go back crook or whatever. <laughs> if the organisation is restructured so that there's more power distributed throughout the organisation instead of being the rich 1% and the plebs mm. at the bottom, there's <laughs> less incentive to try and be psychopathic. Or <laughs> Mm-hmm. You can say, wait a minute, I can be psychopathic, but I'm only going to get an extra 2%. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the last question was, how do you measure the success of this action for the organisation? Is basically by looking at the sickness records of oh. how many times people are taking days off work, or weeks off work, or get clinical diagnoses of whatever. Um, and also you could run tests which exist, like say for instance Briggs Meyer, to identify your leadership, how many more people are leaders, the NTJs, <laughs> 1% last year, 96% this year, oh we've now got a different problem. <laughs> um, and also there's clinical questionnaires you can run to clinically detect psychopathy, in which case, what do we do with Fred? Do we just get, get it for the building now? Do we call it? Or do we actually call it in our social services? It's <laughs> <laughs> so nice idea. Do you call it Fred? Can we come back to my Wow, your conversation went down an interesting route. <laughs> um, last two groups, uh, would you like to share any of your yeah, um, ideas? We did gender pay gap and talk briefly. So, teams, we had this idea that the person who usually gets more money is the most outspoken mm-hmm. male. So, 
we said we'd have a more improved psychological <coughs> safety, so we'd have more structured, inclusive conversations about the work, mm -hmm. be more effective. And we said some other stuff as well, but we said a graph would be sufficient to measure. And if you wanted some numbers, we got two changes, six ideas, and one measurement. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to throw them in here, these ones. Um, cool. Last. Great. We also looked at gender equality. Um, this is maybe not quite a fully formed idea, but we were thinking about how we know the majority of organisations <coughs> were set up and founded by white men, so therefore the structure and what it takes to advance within those structures is potentially leans in that way. So have a look at your structure and look at what it, it is being rewarded to succeed and see mm -hmm. how you can diversify that and therefore diversify the amount, the amount of people who can succeed. Um, we also thought looking at organisations could look at how they write job descriptions because I know there's been a lot of studies into a, a, on a majority of women will read a job description that says something like five years experience if they don't have five years experience look oh I can't apply whereas men have a different reaction and they'll apply anyway in, in majoritively and um, so we thought paying attention to how you're writing your job descriptions and uh, yeah so uh, in the end we had um, I think we had six or seven seven cool. things across the networks, gender equality, social equity, and income and work. Mm-hmm. Cool. I guess the measurement would just be that you would see more diversity come to mm -hmm. the workplace and, and mm -hmm. diversity of people taking leadership positions. Cool. Um, and the drawing that Simon has drawn here is something that Kate Rayworth, who invented Donut e Economics, uh, talks about in terms of like the network effect and becoming more of a networked organisation and a networked um, uh, society as well. So I put a link to the talk, the original talk, she's much more inspiring than me, uh, <laughs> on, uh, on the uh, graphs up front deck that I'll share around. Um, so I just quickly tried to show some of the areas that we talked about and like the amount with these few people in this room, the amount of ideas that you can come up with in uh, half an hour um, and you can already see the different areas that we could potentially impact in terms of our own individual behaviours and our organisational behaviours. Um, I want to say thank you very much uh, for being patient with me and listening to me and thank you very much for wholeheartedly contributing to this exercise as well. Mm -hmm.